ultimately you and I know that the reverse reaction should basically do the opposite of the law of the kindness. Which enzyme works opposite to how a kindness works? What's the name of the enzyme? It's a phosphatase. So definitely the reverse reaction is actually going to be catalyzed by the enzyme glucose 6-phosphatase. <laughs> Guys, without too much explaining, this is the enzyme that will catalyze the reverse of this reaction, and that's where one difference is. Is that okay? So, for gluconeogenesis, to produce free glucose, you actually have the enzyme glucose 6 phosphatase, the same enzyme I told you is found in the endoplasmic reticulum of the hepatocytes and proximal renal tubular cells in the kidney, right? What about here? The first reaction, what's the name of the enzyme in glycolysis? What was the name? PMK1, right? Which we said was a special site for regulation of glycolysis. In fact, it's also a special part for regulation of gluconeogenesis as well, right? Phosphofructokinase 1. This is a kinase. What do you think the name of the enzyme which will catalyze the reverse reaction would be called? What would the name sound? It would be a phosphatase. And you and I know how we name enzymes. We name them mainly based on the reaction they catalyze and the name of the substrate. So it's going to be fructose 1.6 bisphosphatase. So the reverse reaction, fructose 1.6 bisphosphatase. And this is how these two reactions are going to be reversed. Is that okay? Easy, right? We know why this is supposed to be like this. Straightforward. Now, let's try to look at this other reaction. How is it different from these two reactions? Guys, first and foremost, I told you that what determines whether the reaction is going to proceed is the issue of the free energy. And I demonstrated to you last time that the conversion of phosphorinal pyruvate into pyruvate would actually yield a lot of energy. Because one, phosphoenyl pyruvate is an enyl phosphate, highly unstable molecule, which will lose a phosphate, adding on to AT, ATP to form ATP, right? And then at the same time, it produces a more stable molecule called pyruvate. It doesn't have a phosphate. And I also told you that the pyruvate that is going to be produced comes in two forms. It comes in the enyl form, and it comes in the keto form. The most predominant is the keto form. But what happens is that the pyruvate, once it's produced, it will isomerize from the enol to the keto form. This reaction, we call it a totomerization reaction, right? So, when you look at the energy difference between phosphoenol pyruvate, which is highly unstable, and pyruvate, which is rather stable and goes on to isomerize, you well know the energy difference is huge. I gave you an example of what this might look like. We say that if you are in a building, which is on the first floor like ours, you jump downstairs. You jumping downstairs is going to be easy and straightforward, right? It's probably going to be the easiest thing you can do. Just stand close to the window and you're out, right? But the reverse becomes impossible. You can't jump however athletic you can be from the bottom and back into class. You get the sense? So if we are going to think putting the phosphate back on pyruvate, this really seems to be the perfect analogy. You are making a highly unstable molecule from a very stable molecule. You would need the initially you know this reaction gives minus 61.9 you don't choose pay more, right? So you would need to look for a molecule that will give you about this much in order for you to reverse. 
right? We learned in the, uh, bioenergetics that the forward reaction is actually equal to the reverse reaction, the energy that you require, right? Mm -hmm. Except to have an opposite sign. So this is highly exothermic, this is highly endothermic. And in the same way, you would come back into class once you've jumped out of the class. What's the option you're going to use? You use yes. stairs. This reaction is done in a manner similar to how stairs work. So it's not going to happen as one reaction. In fact, it's going to happen as, as if you're moving stairs until you produce a phosphor in our pilot belt. Is that clear? So now, how is this reaction going to proceed? First and foremost, let me show you the simpler way in which it's going to proceed and then I'll explain why it makes sense that it should proceed in that way. The first thing is this. The pilot belt is going to enter into the mitochondria normally with the help of the pyruvate transporter. So this pyruvate will become what we call your pyruvate. Right? And you and I are very used to the reaction where pyruvate is actually converted into acetyl CoA, right? This is the reaction we're used to in the TCA cycle. Remember? Yes. Now, I just want to remind you that this is happening in a circumstance requiring gluconeogenesis. And I think the one way in which you're going to be understanding these things a lot easily is when you think about the circumstance in which these reactions are occurring. Gluconeogenesis is going to occur in a circumstance where there is low amounts of glucose, probably in a circumstance of starvation, right? So if there is low amounts of glucose available, it means the gluconeogenic circumstances would increase. And this is not just going to be restricted to the production of glucose, right? It would be that you start sourcing energy even from other sources, which would be, for example, from fatty acids, right? So if you think about it, what is going to happen is that because you have not eaten these high amounts of glucagon, the enzyme, it will lead to phosphorylation of most enzymes. What you discover is there will be lipolysis, proteolysis, all of them occurring simultaneously. So the result is that from lipolysis, the breakdown of lipids, fatty acids, you're going to produce fatty acids being broken down by beta oxidation to produce high amounts of acetyl CoA. So in this circumstance, where I've not eaten enough carbohydrates, you well know you have high amounts of acetyl CoA. And guys, if you think about the regulation of the enzyme which converts pyruvate into acetyl CoA, the one we call the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex, we made it clear that one of the allosteric inhibitors of this enzyme was acetyl CoA itself. Right? So you and I know, therefore, that since these are gluconeogenic circumstances, this reaction, which converts pyruvate um, into acetyl CoA, is actually going to be highly, highly inhibited because of the high amounts of acetyl CoA. Makes sense? From beta oxidation, you have high amounts of acetyl CoA inhibiting the enzyme which produces acetyl CoA. So this reaction will have stopped to start. The next thing is this. The high amounts of acetyl CoA that are available would have another effect. They will work on the enzyme which converts pyruvate into another molecule called oxaloacetate. You know oxaloacetate, right? Yes. How does this reaction occur? You have your pyruvate. This is pyruvate. And 
this pyruvate is being converted to a molecule of oxaloacetate. And if you remember the structure of oxaloacetate, it looked like that. It had four colors. This is oxaloacetate. So the pyruvate is actually going to receive a carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. Right? The process of addition of carbon dioxide, what is it called? Carboxylation, right? And the reaction is a carboxylation reaction. What do you think the enzyme is going to be called? It's a carboxylase. So this is catalyzed by a carboxylase. And what's that carboxylase? Carboxylating? Pyruvate. So the name is pyruvate. Carboxylase. Guys, like any carboxylase, this enzyme would require the presence of biotin, the vitamin biotin. And guys, we've been quite emphatic on how these vitamins we take in mainly are used as coenzymes for most enzymes. So if you check and find it's a carboxylase, you should know a carboxylase requires biotin for it to carry out this reaction. Also, when you look at this, clearly you know this is bone formation and it would require the presence of energy, right? And of course, energy comes in, ATP, ADP. This reaction is actually going to produce your oxaloacetate from pyruvate. That's the reaction. Is that clear? And we said, this reaction is highly stimulated by acetal for A, which is highly produced in the circumstances of starvation. Therefore, it makes sense that your pyruvate is being converted into acetal for A. And now the next question you're going to ask me is this. All right, fine, we have acetal for A, or we have oxaloacetate rather. So then why is this oxaloacetate combining with the huge amount of acetal for it to go down the TCA cycle, right? Right? Fantastic. Well, it wouldn't. Why? Because to start with, the enzyme that converts oxaloacetate and, and uh, acetal for a into citrate is highly inactive in these circumstances to start with. The second thing is that due to the low amounts of intermediates of, of the glycolytic pathway, right? Of gluconeogenic pathway, this oxaloacetate is quickly going to be isomerized to malic. Also, because anyway, this is happening in a circumstance where there was a lot of beta oxidation. You obviously have high amounts of NADH and high amounts of ATP as well being produced. The TCA cycle is inhibited at isocitrate dehydrogenase, right? So the citrate, the TCA cycle is also not occurring effectively because it has been inhibited at the part of isocitrate dehydrogenase. So you have a buildup of acetal CoA which would have to start going in another direction. When we come to learn about it, you'll discover it's going to go to ketone body synthesis. So you know that this reaction, therefore, is going to favor the conversion of oxaloacetate into malate. This is actually favorable and important and desirable. Why? Because oxaloacetate may not be able to cross the mitochondria and go into the cytosol, which is the site of production of glucose because of its structure. So, oxaloacetate is quickly reduced back to malate. You know this is the last reaction, it was reversible, so oxaloacetate is going to be reduced back to malate with the help of the NADH-dependent malate dehydrogenase, right? So, this malate would then be the one that will be able to cross the mitochondrial membrane 
Remember the properties of the inner mitochondrial membrane? It's highly impermeable, so it can't allow salopacetage to cross. So, mallet moves out of the mitochondria and gets into the cytosol. So you have cytosolic mallet. Then this cytosolic mallet will be oxidized back the help of NADH. Mallet dehydrogenase again to produce oxaloacetates again. And then the oxaloacetate is the one that is going to be converted into phosphoenolpyruvate. How this happens? This has a phosphate in its structure, right? So just to remind you what this looks like. This is your phosphoenol pyruvate, and there is your oxaloacetate. This one has four carbons, this one has three carbons. This one has no phosphate, this one has a phosphate, right? So this reaction <coughs> would require addition of the phosphate. Where does this phosphate come from? It comes from GTP, which is converted to GDP. <coughs> the phosphate attaches there. And in the process, this carbon dioxide is going to come out. And the end result is production of phosphoenol pyruvate from oxaloacetate. The enzyme is actually using the phosphate, it's a kinase, and it's also removing a carbon dioxide. The name is phosphoenolpyruvate carboxy kinase. 